Hey y'all, and welcome back to another video. In this video, we're gonna take a look at scriptable objects, and I'm gonna kick off a little series on the channel that I wanna call Scriptable Cookbook. So these are not gonna be dependent on one another, right? We're gonna keep a nice modular structure, which is one of the reasons actually that we like to use scriptable objects, so we're kinda of getting a little bit meta there. In this one, we're gonna take a look at how to use what I'm calling scriptable variables and scriptable actions. Let's check it out. All right, so first, I wanna give you guys some context before we dive into Unity. Couple things, I'll do it quick. One, I wrote a blog post a couple of years ago for Unity. I'll link it in the description down there. It's got a very nice primer of some of the best content on the web, including some YouTube videos about scriptable objects, including some videos by yours truly, your handsome host. My script plug, my pluggable AI with scriptable objects training that I did for Unity, the text adventure training. It's also worth mentioning my asset strata is heavily based on this kind of pluggable scriptable object architecture, pluggable plug, right? Buy my shit, please, thank you. There's a couple other videos worth mentioning that have come out since then. Brackies has a nice uh, scriptable object video on his channel, shout out to him. Matt Gamble from Game Dev Guide has another one that's quite good. I'll link them both in the description. What I wanna do is actually make this a playlist, obviously including the content that I'm putting out on the topic, but also pulling together a bunch of stuff from across YouTube that's really good. There's a bunch of people covering this in good ways, and I wanna kind of bring it all together into one resource for you guys. So. Let's jump into Unity. So what we've got here is a little simple construction paper, first person shooter. This is a project that I did with my sons. And this is actually cut from a couple years ago now. I just found it on my hard drive and figured I'd resurrect it. We've got these cut out construction paper enemies. They're navigating using the nav mesh agents components from GitHub. They're pre-installed in the project, but if you don't know about them, I recommend you check them out. This guy's going really slowly, so this is a good example of what, whoops, I killed him. This is a good example of, sorry, snake. If we go over to this default enemy move speed, we can actually be in play mode while we do this. It's just a little weird with the first person camera, but if you can see in the scene view, go ahead and change the speed. We can see that both of our guys respond. We can slow them back down before they get to us and kill us. Pew, pew. And so what we can see when we shoot them is they get deactivated, spawn some particles, and have a couple of little actions that happen when they die. And those are also achieved with scriptable objects. So there's two kind of sides to this. Also, I don't know what's going on, but my neighbor is like assembling Ikea or something. He's been banging for hours. I was waiting to record the video, but I'm just, I'm just gonna do it, right? You guys will be all right with a little banging? Sorry. Okay, two ways to use them. One, just for numbers, right? Or for variables. So what I've got here is this default enemy move speed is just a scriptable object that holds a float. It means that we can adjust it at runtime, right? During play mode and the values will persist. As you can see, the last value I entered has not been reset when exiting play mode. And we have multiple enemies, in this case, the snake, is referencing it here in his enemy agent component. The zombie is referencing it as well. These are actually prefab variants of the snake, so they're also linked together by the prefab system. But in this case, we are sharing that value across multiple places by making it an asset. Here it is in our project, right? And this is one of the great uses of scriptable objects is to make custom data containing assets. We're doing the same thing for the default enemy health. Currently it's one. If I change it, everything that references it will reflect that change. Now, that's somewhat basic, right? Let's take a look at the move speed script. Super simple. We can see that we have the public field of the type float called value. That's where we're setting the number. It inherits from scriptable object. That's important. That's how you make it a scriptable object. And then the create asset menu attribute allows you to create custom assets and store them in your project. This is all content that's covered elsewhere, including by me, so I'm not gonna belabor it, just quick refresher for those who are new. Okay, the next thing that's really cool is that we can create scriptable objects that hold code. And this is my favorite approach. This is where we get into these almost visual programming like 
pluggable kind of Lego brick component functionality systems. So if we look at our snake, we'll see that it has this damageable object script. This is a script that receives damage from the Raycast weapon that the player is shooting. That's actually based on another tutorial I did for Unity years ago. It's called Let's Try Shooting with Raycasts. Look it up if you want. What we have is we have this list of death actions. Right now, these are scriptable objects of the type scriptable action. So here's the script for that. Again, really simple, inherits from scriptable object, but importantly, this is an abstract class, right? What this means is that it has an incomplete implementation that's gonna be overridden by classes that derive from it. But basically what we need to know is that this means we can have an abstract function which is not implemented. So we see, we see that we have this public abstract function that returns void called perform action, which takes a game object as an argument. Now, there's no implementation for this, which means in every class that inherits from scriptable action, we can define this differently, but if we know we have a scriptable action object, we know it always has perform action, and we can always call that function on it. And that is where the flexibility and the decoupling really comes in. Right now, you could do this with many types of classes. This is not something unique to scriptable object. What's nice is that it allows us to define these via the inspector. So now, if we go back to the inspector, we can see that we have in our snake two scriptable actions. We have spawn and despawn action and deactivate action. Let's look at spawn and despawn action first. Now, take a look. It's an asset. So this is one instance of it. We could actually have multiple, right? One that spawns particles as this one does. Another one that spawns maybe two smaller copies of the enemy. If we had like a slime enemy that we want to cut in half and have it respawn, we would make a copy of the asset and define the behavior differently. Right here, I just have one. In this case, it spawns the enemy death particle. And if we take a look at the script, spawn and, oh, it's called spawn and destroy action. That's actually, oh, that's wild that that compiles. That's interesting. I think I'm gonna have to remake the asset here now. Okay, so that's an interesting one. We had, I was renaming it, but basically to create one of these, we just go to actions, spawn and despawn, right? This is, we'll just call it new spawn and despawn action. The number of objects is gonna be this. It's gonna be our enemy death particle. Whoops, it's on the other screen. It's gonna be our enemy death particles. Boy, that banging is really helping the video. Thanks, neighbor. And the despawn delay can be like point, 0.3 seconds should be fine. Okay, this actually gives us a good opportunity to refresh our understanding there. Let's delete it. And then in the snake, we see we have a missing scriptable action. Let's replace it. And because, and then let's apply this as an override because this is the master prefab and the other ones are variants. If we apply it, they should all, yeah, get updated, good. Okay, this is gonna run over this list. So let's take a look at what happens here. So. In the script, we have our create asset menu attribute, so we can give it a name and create it from the menu like we just saw. It inherits from scriptable action, that's critical. And then it's got this public array of game objects that we're gonna spawn. It's got a public despawn delay, right, which we just set. And then here is the unique implementation of perform action. Now, remember in the abstract class, this was not implemented, it didn't do anything. Now, we're gonna do the specific thing that this is gonna do and we're gonna do it by looping over all of the objects to spawn and destroy using a for loop, and then we are going to declare a prefab variable of the type game object, which is the iterator of the loop, and we're gonna spawn a clone of it using instantiate, pass in the prefab, pass in the transform position and the transform rotation, from the object. Now this is important when you're working with scriptable objects, they're not living in the scene, right? This is an asset outside. So it doesn't have knowledge of the scene. So what we need to do is any references to the scene or the game world, we need to pass them into the function call. We also don't wanna be creating like a 
public target game object field on the asset and be setting that because that actually would be saved as a reference. The way you want to do it is you just want to pass any scene data as an argument into the function call. So we're going to pass in the object. In this case, it'll just be the object that's getting destroyed. And then we can use that data to position it. We can use the, the transform rotation and the transform position to position the, in this case, the spawned particles. Then we just call the destroy function pass in the cloned object and our delay. Important caveat, because this is the internet and I know people will say meh, 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 meh. Instantiating and destroying a lot are expensive operations that can trigger allocations of the garbage collector. So the most optimal way to do this would be with an object pool, uh, but it's not the point of this exercise, right? So I'm doing it in a more convenient, but slightly less performant way. Okay, so now let's look at the way that this is being called from damageable object. It's actually really, really simple. All we have to do is when our current health falls to zero, we're gonna call the die function. The die function loops over all the death actions. Now what's cool here is there could be 500 death actions, right? If it was the boss or something, you know, you want to open a door or whatever you want to do in the game, right? You could just go over that list and perform them all. And this script doesn't need to know about it, right? It has no dependency. It just goes down the list and says, yeah, do all this stuff, whatever it is, spawn a wall, sure, spawn particles, sure, sounds, whatever, right? So, and, and that way you could start to get into some interesting chains of behavior, right? You could spawn another enemy or, or some loot or, or whatever you want, right? So we're just going to go down our list and call the perform action method that is embedded in our scriptable object, right? So this is where that abstract class functionality comes in because it's saying, yeah, I know I've got a bunch of stuff that's death actions. I know I need to perform an action. I don't know what that is. It could be spawning something. It could be deactivating something. It could be opening a door. It could be updating the score, whatever. I just know I need to perform an action. I know all these objects are going to implement perform action. So bing, 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 bing. We go down the list and perform all those actions. Let's take a look at the second action here, which is the deactivate action. And this has the same benefit that if I wanted to run multiple spawn and despawn actions, maybe with different delays, I would just add them to this list of death actions and they'll all be run through. I don't have to write a lot of code being like, okay, here's the reference to the particles. Here's a reference to all the game objects that you need to spawn. Here's all this other stuff, right? It just says, well, give me whatever's in the list and I'm just gonna do it. So there's a nice kind of decoupling there. If we look at the deactivate action, this is dead simple. All it does is just takes in a reference to the game object that we pass in when we call the function and just calls set active false. This is a slightly more performant way to do it instead of destroying it. So there, there you go, there's some, some best practices for you. But here's another example, right? Another uh, different implementation of the perform action function. In this case, just deactivating whatever object was being destroyed. All right, and so then the last little detail that I put in here just to show why this might be fun, right, is in damageable object, we also have the ability boop, to shoot the trees, right? And now this does something different. This will trigger our fall over animation action. We just have the trigger name, which is start fall, and we're just setting the trigger parameter start fall. That's the condition for the animation to start falling. We're setting it from our trigger animation action here. And it's really the same pattern. We're just saying, okay, take the game object that comes in when we call the function. In this case, we're getting component in children just to find an animator on it. And then if the animator does not equal null, then we're just calling animator.setTrigger and passing in that string that we defined in the scriptable object for the trigger name to trigger the animation. Hopefully you guys found this useful and a little bit interesting. I'm going to continue this as a little micro series on the channel. Please give me a comment down below if you have a topic about scriptable objects you're curious, confused, or interested about. I'm gonna to try to do some things that I haven't seen other people do. This is a little bit of, re of a refresher on some existing content, hopefully in a more compact and snappy format. But if you're enjoying the content, please do consider subscribing and drop a like on the video. It helps me to get discovered by other people on YouTube. Uh, and as always, thanks for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.